John chapter number 20. Again, thank you for being here. I've had this thought all week, and I could not get it off my heart. I will caution you, this is a, a Thad Abbott introduction. That means the introduction is going to be longer than the message. There are several things I want to bring out of, out of our text uh, to lay the foundation, but once we get to the message, uh, it's, it's, it's just what we need. Amen. John chapter 20, we'll begin reading verse number 19. The Bible says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, and that's why we worship on Sunday, by the way, Amen. Jesus rose from the grave on the first day of the week. It says, When the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, for your presence today. Now, Father, help us from the word of God. Lord, we're thankful for your uh, wonderful scriptures. They're a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Lord, when life doesn't make sense, we can find a verse that will give us peace for our troubled souls. Now, Father, I thank you, Father, for these that have assembled here today. I thank you for the one precious soul that was saved over at the jail. Lord, I fear there may be somebody here today that's been in church all their life, maybe a member of this church and been for a long time, but, Lord, they've never been born again. And God, I pray that if such is the case, that today you would, uh, Lord, grip their heart Show them their need of salvation and help them to be saved today. Father, maybe someone's troubled. I pray that you would certainly minister the, to their heart today. Maybe someone's struggling. Maybe someone's weak. Maybe someone facing great obstacles. Lord, I don't know what people need, but you know what everybody needs. You know our yesterdays. You know our today. And you even know our tomorrow. So, Father, help us this day to embrace what thus saith the Lord. May we find it precious to our soul. May you administer help to the hurting. And God will thank you for it. Use this unworthy vessel. Get glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. I want, as a way of introduction, look at several things. Uh, well, here we find, uh, uh, first of all, the disciples in confinement. The Lord Jesus has was crucified. He'd been in the grave three days and three nights, and on the first day of the week, he rose from the grave. Uh, we know he rose from the dead. We know that he has appeared unto Mary, and he's told her to go and tell his disciples, and, and Peter also, uh, that uh, he has risen from the dead, and that he will appear unto them shortly. Uh, and you know the story, when she came and told him she'd seen him, uh, she had supposed his voice to be the voice of a gardener, but uh, when he called her by name, Mary, uh, she knew who he was. Uh, you say, how could she not recognize Jesus? The last time they saw him, uh, he was beaten beyond recognition, uh, but now he's risen from the grave and he's in a glorified body. He doesn't look like he did before. Uh, and uh, uh, she uh, uh, says, I've seen him, I've seen him. Uh, and, and Peter and John run down to the tomb uh, and we find they go in and uh, as they go in they find the grave clothes uh, wadded up and thrown over in the corner and they find the uh, napkin which was upon his face folded up and, and neatly placed there in the grave and what symbolism to the Jew uh, if uh, you entertain somebody in your house uh, and they came to your house uh, 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 and you uh, served them and you fed them uh, if they were pleased with how uh, 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 that uh, you uh, uh, 
uh, treated them, they would take the napkin from the plate and fold it and put it on the plate. Uh, 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 if they were not pleased, uh, they would wad it up and throw it in the corner. Uh, 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 and it was a great symbol. Uh, if, they were not, uh, if they were not treated well, if they came into your house and you did not wash their feet from the hot sand that they'd been walking in, uh, if you did not feed them well, if you did not show them hospitality, uh, they'd wad the napkin up and throw it to the side and said, uh, I was mistreated. I did not appreciate how I was treated uh, and I have no plans to ever go through this experience again. Uh, but if they found that napkin uh, all folded up and nice, they said uh, it was a symbol that, uh, hey, uh, there's something here worth coming back for. Uh, uh, Peter and James saw the grave clothes wadded up and thrown to the side. Uh, Jesus said, uh, I didn't appreciate how I was mistreated uh, and I will never experience this again. Uh, but they saw that napkin that was over his face folded up uh, and that said, uh, hey, there's something worth coming back for. Uh, hey, well, I got good news. He is coming back for his church. Hallelujah. And then we find as she comes, the disciples have now assembled. It's evening time. Uh, and they're assembled in that upper room. They're in confinement for fear of the Jews. You see, the Jews had already said they'd murdered Jesus and now whoever followed him was next. So we see the confinement, but notice the comfort. Look what happens. Uh, it says, uh, uh, They were assembled for fear of the Jews, and came Jesus, and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. I don't care how much bondage you may feel like you're in. I don't care how much trouble you may be facing. Uh, all it takes is a good word from the Lord uh, to bring comfort to your troubled soul. Uh, we see the confinement. We see the comfort. But notice the confirming. Look in verse number 20. And when he had said so, he showed unto them his hands uh, and his side. Uh, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Uh, you see, he had spoke to them, but until he showed them that it was him, they did not rejoice. And can I say even in our day, even though we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. Even though the Lord will speak to us from his word, and can I say, until he shows up and confirms some things in our lives, a lot of times we don't trust him. We're not glad for what the Lord's doing. Notice, if you will, his commission to them in verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And he commissions them. And he will later, when he ascends into heaven, ascends into heaven, he will give them further details that he will commission them to take the gospel to every creature. And then notice, if you will, the conferring in verse 22. In verse 22, the Bible says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Uh, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Uh, can I say verses uh, 22 and 23 are misunderstood verses in the Scripture? You and I who are saved by the good grace of God, who have studied the Scriptures, under understand that uh, from the time Jesus rose from the dead and through the early church, uh, there was a tr transition from Judaism to the grace age or the day of the Gentiles or what we know as the day of the church. There's a transitioning period. As a matter of fact, in the first few chapters of the book of Acts, the first uh, eight or nine chapters, you'll find there are four different ways that folks get saved by the grace of God. They're saved by the Lord Jesus, but there's four different modes or methods. And can I say they each transition, or for a lack, and I mean a big lack of better terms, they evolve to what we have today. The final uh, uh, way, and I believe it's actually in Acts chapter 11, you see they hear the word of God, and when they hear the word, they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved, and they receive the Holy Spirit. But up until then, uh, after they would hear and believe, then the apostles would have to lay hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit. And there are many people that will take this passage, and they'll take those transitioning points, and they'll build a whole denomination on something that the Lord Jesus was transitioning to get to where we are today. 
You see, in 1 Corinthians, we find the Apostle Paul pinned down when that which is perfect shall come, that which is in part shall be done away with. And can I say, a lot of people say, well, the only one's perfect is Jesus, so until he comes, we'll do this and do that. That's not what he was talking He was talking about the Scriptures. When that which is perfect shall come. What's he talking about? He said tongues shall cease. Uh, he said prophecies shall uh, end. But what was he talking about? He's talking about the completed Word of God. And now we have everything we need. Yeah, but you see, we know when we save, or you could say, believe on the uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, and the Lord takes up His abode in us through the Holy Spirit of God. But you see, these fellows had believed on the Lord. They were the Lord's disciples. They were the ones He has commissioned to go. But now they needed that element that they did not have, and He breathed on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And so that's important to understand. A lot of people say, well, they didn't get the Spirit till the day of Pentecost. Well, that's not what John chapter 20 says. And a lot of people say the church didn't start till the day of Pentecost. Well, what do you do with the 120 in the upper room? Jesus started the church in himself and when he was on earth. He commissioned the church when he ascends and then he empowered the church on the day of Pentecost. Well, that's why we're Bible believers. We believe what the Bible says, not what somebody dreamed up somewhere. But what is very confusing is uh, uh, verse 23 says, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. There were people who say, well, the uh, disciples decided who could get saved and who could not get saved. The disciples are the ones who forgave sin and didn't forgive sin. That's not what he's saying. He is saying, even as the Father sent me, so send I you. And then he gives them the Holy Ghost. Uh, and he says, whosoever sins you, you remit. They're remitted. Whosoever you retain, they retain. What he's saying is if you don't take the gospel to folks who need the gospel, then their blood will be required at your hands. You have the keys to the kingdom. What are you going to do with it? You can take it to lost people and tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will work to where they can get saved or you can keep it to yourself and then their blood will be required at your hands that's what he's saying they are now responsible for taking the gospel to a lost and dying world we see that but notice I got to move on notice the con, con, uh, uh, conveying in verse 24 but Thomas can I say when you got sheep you might have a goat sheep follow goats butt but Thomas. Now, I'm not saying Thomas is not saved. Thomas is one of the disciples. But he's one of them saved sheep that are all the time butting in, all the time going against the grain. Won't do what the Lord says and won't believe it unless God sends a lightning bolt to strike them. Huh? There are people that way. There are people, uh, uh, the man of God will spend time with God, get alone with God, get the vision of God, and God will say, do a 24-7 prayer chain there. Some say, who does he think he is? I'm not going to do it. God didn't speak to me about doing it, so I'm not going to do it. Well, if you're a member of the church, and you've got confidence that uh, the pastor is the man of God, and if God tells the pastor you need to do something, it's not up to you to question God or question the pastor. It's up to you to say, yes, Lord. There are some things you don't have to pray about. You know what you don't have to pray about? You don't have to pray whether or not it's a good time to pray. You don't have to pray whether or not uh, uh, we need to pray for sinners, need to pray for sick. You don't have to pray whether or not we're going to take the gospel places. You don't have to pray about those things. Hmm? But yet, there are people who want to make issues about everything. Brother Larry, if you came to me today and said, well, the Lord spoke to me, I wouldn't say, but uh, until I see the nail prints in his hands and his feet, I'm not going to believe it. It was the Lord speaking to you. I'm going to believe you had a banana and peanut butter sandwich and went to bed and you had a real bad experience. <laughs> but there are people that way. That's what Thomas is doing. Here, the other ten disciples plus everybody else that was in that upper room said the Lord showed up. And he got one person. Well, I don't believe it. Look what it says. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. What is your first problem? If he'd have been there, he'd have known what the Lord did. Huh? You know, it's never as good hearing it secondhand. Boy, we've had services where God showed up so big. Isn't it amazing when you try to tell somebody how God showed up big, they have no idea what you're talking about. But if they'd been there. Yeah. Huh? Amen. He said, uh, 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 and then the other disciples therefore said, verse 25, said unto him, we have seen the Lord. Huh? 
They're, con they're conveying, they're reporting, they're testifying what God's done. Hmm. I mean, if, if one kooky person, let's see, who's kooky in here today? You're kooky every day. I said Wednesday, I, I quoted out of the book of James. I said, well, don't listen to this James because he's never said anything worth listening to. So kooky James stands up and says he's seen something. Unless Renee was with him, I'm not going to believe it. <laughs> but if that whole row back there, Brother John and Brother Ty and, and, and Brother Trent and, and Brother Todd, who's probably kooky too, if they all said they seen something, I'd probably say, well, they probably saw something. Hmm. No. Notice the challenge. Look what Thomas says. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Yeah. You know, we know Thomas is known as Doubting Thomas, and can I say, nowhere after this point do you hear anything out of Thomas. After John 20, you never find Thomas ever preaching a message in the book of Acts. You never find Thomas pastoring a church. You never find Thomas doing anything for God. Why? Because without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. He's doubting Thomas. He needs proof. And can I say, you know what's sad? You'll find a Thomas in every Baptist church in America. No matter what God does for other people, it's never good enough for them. Mm. Now notice the certifying. Look at verse 26. And after eight days, again his disciples are within and Thomas with them. What a blessing he decided to show up that day. He wasn't fishing or playing golf or anything. He was there. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Let me just stop right there. You've got to understand the Bible. Door's shut. They're locked inside. Jesus shows up. How'd he get there? I told you he's in his glorified body. He is now no longer limited by space or by elements. He just walked through the wall. So I don't believe it. Well, John pinned it down under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, which God told him to pin it down, which means it was so. And uh, if I believe John th 3, 16, i got to believe uh, John 20, 26. He just showed up. Well, how did he do that? Let me help you. He's God. No big thing for God. I mean, he took nothing and made everything. You think that was a big deal for him to show up? You think a lot can keep God out? He rolled a stone back when he rose from the dead. You think that a lock's going to keep God out? Uh, uh, but anyway, that's not the message. He said, Peace be unto them. Look at verse 27. Then said he to Thomas. Now, nobody told the Lord, but the Lord knew this too. Why? Because he's God. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet, I believe. You can write your name right next to verse number 29 if you've believed on the Lord because you're blessed. We see the conversion of Thomas after the Lord certified he was God. Hmm. Now I want to draw your attention to three passages. We'll get to the message. I want you to look with me in verse number 20. It says, And when he had so said, said what? Peace be unto you. He showed unto them his hands and aside. Hmm. Now look with me in verse 25. Thomas says, But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now look at verse 27. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And we find in three different uh, uh, verses in this text, mention of the Lord's hands, 
and aside. One songwriter wrote, the only thing in heaven made by man are the scars in the hands in the side of the Lord Jesus. Scars in his feet. It's the only thing in heaven made by man. The scars of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to preach for just a few minutes, very few minutes this morning, on this thought. The message in scars. What a message. Jesus shows up, he says, peace be unto them. It didn't calm them. But he just showed them his hands and his side. And they knew it was the Lord. Thomas, in his doubt, said, except I be able to see his hands and thrust my finger in them and thrust my hand in his side, I will not believe. Jesus shows up again, and he looks at Thomas and says, take your finger and thrust it in, take your hand and thrust it in. There's something about those scars. Those scars will identify who the Lord Jesus is, but those scars bring comfort and bring hope and bring faith to those who see them. There's something about scars that are life-altering. So there's a meaning and a message in scars. Can I say, first of all, scars reveal that one's been hurt. You'll never ever see anything about scars that didn't pre wasn't preceded by injury. And can I say what's so important about the Lord Jesus' scars uh, is they nailed him to the cross in his hands and his feet uh, and they thrust the spear into his side to prove that he was dead. Uh, those were scars inflicted uh, on the Lord Jesus through much pain and much injury. Uh, can I say the Lord Jesus uh, who did no sin uh, uh, became uh, your and my sin that he might redeem us from our sin uh, and those scars injured the very Son of God. Uh, those scars paid our sin debt. Uh, those scars uh, caused the great uh, Heavenly Father to see the travail of his soul and to be pleased and satisfied uh, with the Lamb of God and the sacrifice uh, that was done that day on Calvary. Uh, those scars uh, uh, show uh, there was much hurt caused to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and I say all of heaven was broken because of those scars. Can I say the average man, it took three to four days to die on a cross. And eventually after all the suffering, the guards would come and break their legs because what kept people alive is they would be drowning in their own fluids and they would uh, uh, raise up and get in a gasp of breath. And when they would break their legs, they could no longer grasp for breath and the fluids would succumb them and they would drown was what would kill him on a cross. Jesus hung on the cross for six hours. That's why when, the, when they came, they actually come to break the legs because Passover was coming and it was under the law. Nobody could be on the cross uh, during Passover. Uh, and uh, they said, he's already dead. And they said, we don't believe it. He's only been hanging here a short time. Uh, that's why they thrust the spear in his side to see if he was dead. See, they did not kill the Lord Jesus, but he gave up the ghost. He gave his life for you and I. But while he was on the cross, the first three hours, we find the seven chains from the cross and the seven messages. And what a great message. Why, he is sitting there in suffering and agony, dying for your and my sin. He cries, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And oh, in the midst of it all, uh, he cried, uh, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, when he was on the cross after the third hour, Brother Lawrence, darkness came over all the face of the earth. In the middle of the day, it's total darkness. Why? I'll give you a little science lesson here. Science will teach you we have the sun, which burns off supernova, which is a big ball of gas, and the explosions of the supernova give off heat and light. And that the moon at night just reflects the sun's light. Well, you go back and study your Bible. God made light before he put the sun and the moon and the stars in the sky. The sun doesn't give light. Light comes from God. 
And the sun's just a little closer to God than the moon. And the sun uh, burns off brighter than uh, uh, the moon. But I want to tell you something. Uh, 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 All of heaven was heartbroken at what the darling Son of God did when He, uh, the Lord, laid on Him the iniquity of us all. And God the Father, who's holy uh, and righteous, uh, could not look upon sin, uh, had to turn His back on the sun. uh, And all the angelic hosts is heartbroken and weeping that day. uh, And when God turned His back, Hey, uh, the light went out on this thing. Uh, There was great injury done to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Godhead. And those scars represent that. But let me break it down a little personal level. Scars show you've been hurt. Can I say, if you've lived life any length of time at all, you've got some scars. There's physical scars. I've had two back surgeries and a shoulder surgery, and I did a lot of stupid things when I was young. And I have scars on my body. I have scars on my knees because I played shortstop, and then that day uh, uh, you were allowed to block the bag, and when they come in sliding a steel second, I had my leg down in front of the bag and would catch the ball from the uh, catcher and, and tag him out. They'd never get to the bag. But them metal cleats got to my knees. Mm. And I say, I got a, a scar on the top of one of my feet where I first started wearing metal cleats and the cleats of my day weren't like the cleats of the day and we didn't have the little thing in the tongue that kept the tongue from going over to the side uh, and, and uh, uh, my sock is exposed and I came down and I uh, uh, tripped over something. My cleat went right into the top of my foot. I still remember that pain. I was six years old. I still remember that. It's because of that these little guys today aren't allowed to wear metal spikes at that age. Uh, scars show physical pain. You have suffered something physically. You have a scar to show for it. I said playing a tournament down in Frankfurt this weekend. And Friday night, there was a girl from another team warming up. And she's throwing... A, a, a ball and, and, and doing the little infield thing while the pitcher's warming up and, and she looks and the sun is just cresting over the left field and she looks up to catch the ball from the girl cut, throwing it to her from the second base back she puts her glove here the only problem was the ball was here hit her right in the eye socket immediately it busted open in blood hey she, they was going to have to sew up her eyebrow she's going to have a scar the rest of her life showing what happened on a softball field on a Friday night when the sun got in her eyes Scars show you've been hurt. Shows physical pain. Can I say? You can have scars from emotional pain. Can I say there are people who face emotional pain, and they say emotional pain is far worse than the physical pain. Can I say if you get cut, it'll heal. But can I say that emotional pain a lot of times takes a whole lot more for that to get better. It's one thing if somebody comes up and they cut you. It's another thing if people tell you you're worthless. And you live the rest of your life thinking that you're worthless. That you can never do good. And yet there are, there are people who abuse other people, whether they're raising them in a parent, parental uh, uh, situation or whether they're married to them in a spousal situation, and all they do is tell the other person how useless they are used to have a dear lady come to our church. Her name's back there on that banner of Trophies of Grace. Sister Brenda Corbin. Through diabetes, she lost her legs and she lost her eyesight. She was in a wheelchair. And that dear woman, Brother Brian, lived to get to come to church. Her husband didn't know the Lord. And he lived to make her miserable. He would go off to work and never put a cup down for her to be able to get a drink of water knowing she couldn't get up there and reach up there and grab a cup out of the cupboard. She would say, can you please take me to Walmart? And he'd say, why? You can't walk around. He'd tell her, why, why do you listen to all that, that tape on the Bible? Why do you listen to all that preaching? It ain't doing you any good. And then she'd plead and beg with him to bring her to church. And if he did... He'd open up the doors and just shove her in. Purposely come and get, get her late. Sometimes people would have to wait an hour after service for him to pick her up so that people would say, Brenda, don't come back. 
He'd constantly tell her how useless and worthless she was. She was in the hospital one time. She told me, she said, Brother Doug, the emotional scars are far worse than when he used to beat me when I was younger and had my legs. There are people who live with emotional scars. You see, we don't identify with them, Miss Mary. See, if you came in, you had a big cut on your face. We'd say, oh, what happened to you? you say, well, I cut my face. Well, okay. But see, we can't see them emotional scars. That's why I say you never know what's behind the smiles of people when they come to church. That's why when people come to church, they need to feel welcome. They need to see this is a place where they are loved and they are accepted and people who care about them. And even more importantly, the Lord Jesus cares about them. Their emotional hurt associated with scars. There's physical hurt associated with scars. And then there's that hurt of the heart. You know, one one poet once said, it's better to Not that their heart's been ripped out by somebody. Right. Huh? Remember that first school girl crush that wasn't Sunny? <laughs> and you thought you was everything and she told you one day you weren't. Yep. Yeah. Hurt. You didn't ever want to love again. Then one day you showed up in church and you saw that. And she was so lovely and so wonderful. And you forgot all about that, that, that first love. True. Yeah. You found out what real love was. Right. Huh? How long has it been? 30 years? Long, long, mm, long time. Long time. 42. 42. That's real long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 42 years and still in love ain't love grand still dress alike. Huh? Yeah. He's the one fella that takes her everywhere, not because he doesn't want to have to kiss her goodbye. Some of you get that. Some of you take your wife everywhere because you don't want to have to kiss her goodbye. He takes her everywhere because he loves her. There's a difference. Huh? But boy, if you've ever had somebody rip your heart out. Sometimes children will rip a mama or a daddy's heart out. Sometimes a parent will rip a child's heart out. Sometimes giving your heart to somebody else that really doesn't matter will rip your heart out. You see, a scar shows you've been hurt. There's a message in that scar. Amen. Everybody has scars, and everybody's message may be different. But there's a message behind that hurt. Can I say, not only does a scar show that there's been hurt, but a scar shows that you're human. Hmm. Listen, Job says man's days are few and full of trouble. Hmm? There's only been one person ever walked the face of the earth since Adam and Eve fell to sin, who's been perfect, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And in John chapter 20, we find he had scars. Why? Because he put on flesh. And scars show you're human. It shows you've lived Shows that you've went through experience in this life. Shows the thorns and thistles of this world from the curse of sin have affected you in one way, shape, or form. Scar shows you're human. Hmm? Let me say this lastly. It says it's short, not much. There's a message in the scars. They show hurt. They show you're human. Hmm? There's nobody got a halo because we all got scars. But scar shows you've been healed. You don't have a wound. You have a scar. Isn't it amazing that they wanted to see his scars, but he's risen from the dead. And he's got healing in his wings. Huh? Huh? Scars show you've been healed. I read this about scars. It says, Scars are areas of fibrous tissue that replace normal skin after injury. A scar results from the biological process of wound repair in the skin and other tissues of the body. Thus, scarring is a natural part of the healing process. You can claim evolution all you want to. I'm telling you, it took a sovereign God, Brother Larry, to make you to know being human, you was going to get scarred. Right. Knowing that scars show that you'd be hurt. Yeah. But also knowing that if there's going to be a wound, you're not going to be able to heal it. It's going to have to heal itself. 
And there has to be healing. There has to be a way for that uh, wound to close up and begin to heal. Uh, I've got good news. Uh, Hey, we were all injured and scarred by sin. Uh, We were born into this world. Uh, Our mother shaped us in iniquity and we came forth as sinners. Uh, Hey, we were scarred by sin, uh, but Jesus Christ came uh, uh, full of grace and truth uh, Hey, to bring the healing process for sin. Uh, Hey, he became our sin debt and became like us that one day we could be like him and be made in the righteousness of him by being robed in his righteousness Uh, even though still in the flesh uh, our sin curse could be healed hallelujah there's a story behind every scar but the fact that it's scarred shows it's healed those scars of the heart and those emotional scars may still be open wounds but the same one that can heal your soul can heal your spirit and heal your heart and his name is Jesus he is the great physician how in the world can he tell Thomas to thrust his hand in his side unless that thing was healed from the inside out If it was still an open wound, Brother James, he'd be bleeding. But it's just an open crevice that you can get to the heart of God. And you can be healed within and without in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a message in scars. Yes, scars reveal hurt. Maybe there's some internal hurt that needs to be dealt with today so it can be healed yes they reveal you're human I don't know why we go what we go through but only to know this that when Adam and Eve sinned problems came into this world and somehow it's just our lot in life to face whatever you're facing you say I didn't deserve this no you didn't but you got it anyway now sometimes scars are of our own making but many times they're not why they call it accident it just happens just happens you just didn't focus for one second and there it was I've got news for every scar there is healing and that healing is found in a name a name above every name and his name is Jesus Say, Brother Doug, you don't know what people have said about me. No, but they said far worse about Jesus. And he said, cast all your cares on him, for he careth for you. And Jesus can help you, friend. He's a present help in time of trouble. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He has a balm of Gilead in his wings. Can I say this morning, he takes the broken heart and mends it. Uh, He binds up the wounds and mollifies them. Uh, Only Jesus can help you today. Boy, there's been many times in my office, right down the hall over here, I've had to sit across from a desk from people who are hurting. Brother Pete, there are many times I've said, boy, I wish I had a magic wand I could wave and it all go away. Chief, there are times I've had to sit there and look at people and have no words to offer them that will bring comfort. But all I could do was point them to the one who is the comforter of the soul. Brother Lawrence, there's been people I've seen so broken that you wonder if they're ever going to make it. And then Jesus step into their life. And some of them are sitting here today and you wouldn't even recognize them. There are some that have come later than when they saw them in their first estate and wouldn't even know they ever had any problems. Why? Because Jesus heals. said all that say this this morning if Jesus was concerned about them fellows being tore up and afraid of the Jews in that upper room and he showed up to say peace be unto you more than once if Jesus was even concerned about the one who doubted him and showed up to comfort him if Jesus rose from the dead and he did 
If Jesus was concerned about them, he didn't love them any more than he loves you. He didn't care about them any more than he cares about you. He gave me this message this morning to let you know there's hope. And hope's in him. Amen. And he'll help you today Amen. if you're willing to give him your wounds. The only way you'll get help is if you learn to give it to Jesus. For the broken heart, he'll fill it with himself. With the troubled soul, he'll fill it with his peace. For the one that thinks they'll never see the sun shine again, he becomes the sun in their life. And friend, he'll help you today, no matter what you're faced. There's a message in scars, and the message is this. No matter the hurt, no matter the circumstance, no matter the situation, Jesus is bigger than your hurt, your circumstance, and your situation. And all he is waiting on is you to believe in him. Thomas didn't get the help the other ones did because Thomas didn't, wasn't there to believe on him. If you'll just believe in him, you'll find help from the glory world that has satisfied your hurt in the natural world. Let's all stand, Brother Ray.